All right, don't read this. Let's just talk about this for a second. Accessibility on online materials anyway, have really been measured against physical access. The same application for physical access has been applied to online environments as well as materials. So when thinking of that process, what I want you to think about is, is there a physical access point that we could think is usable by everybody? Literally, it's accessible, it's usable by everybody. You might have used it this morning, you might have used it yesterday, you might have used it earlier this week, at any point in time you might have used it. I know you use it most likely once, unless, well, I'm not going to give it away. So think of a physical access point, literal physical point, where you're going to it, and it's usable by everybody, no matter your ability. Can you, any guesses? Anybody? Think hard. It's really easy. Literally usable by everybody. Physical access point. I'll give you another hint. It's in a path of travel. Sidewalk? That's the second one I'm going to talk about, but that's really good. Anything else? Door. Say that again? Door. And what door? Right? And what, what, what about the door makes it usable by everybody? Handle? No. Automatic, Automatic doors. Cool. Yes. That is the perfect example. That's that aspirational process that we're talking about. Automatic doors, and I'm not talking about the ones that you have a push button on. I'm talking about a Target or you know, other department stores where literally it's an automatic door and you just have to show up to it and there's a sensor and it sees you and you can use it no matter your ability. It doesn't matter. That's the aspiration we need to be in dealing with accessibility. Actually, it goes beyond accessibility. Accessibility helps us get to the point of usability for everybody. So that's where we want to be over time. It's not gonna to happen tomorrow. It's going to take time. I mean, those type of automatic doors took a while to actually become censored like that to where they can actually work. I mean, the first automatic door was way back when, and it was actually created so doors could close. This was in Texas. Lots of winds were blowing these doors open out of the hands of customers that were coming to their particular store. And these individuals decided, well, we got to figure out something because we need to close this door. And they found out, well, okay, let's do an automatic mechanism. And that was the necessity, so they created an automatic door. It wasn't because a person with a disability needed to get access. It was because they needed to get the door closed. And then they found out that they, we could then apply it to other processes. And then it grew to the point of where it is now. Now we actually have this truly universal point that everybody can use. So I want you to think about this in this next process. We were talking about sidewalks. So here we are in another path of travel. What about sidewalks is universal? What access point on the sidewalks makes that a universal? The curb cut? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. The curb cut. Now that was originally designed, unlike the automatic door, for persons with disabilities, specifically mobility devices, that type of thing. Now, in that process, do you think that there's more people who use that curb cut than those persons with disabilities? Right. I mean, I don't know how many times I've been carrying something, you know, rolling it along or using a shopping cart or doing something illegal like riding my bike up on the sidewalk. <laughs> I mean, yes, that's the point. And, and now this was actually designed for accessibility, and, but it actually benefits everybody. And that's the whole aspirational point of this, is we want to design accessibly, but then grow it to the point of where it benefits everybody. So. Accessibility actually does inform the process to where we have a truly usable environment that over time might reach that accessible door access. So keep in your mind, that's where we want to be. Now, I will say this. Do you think we'll ever be 100% accessible? 
There's no right or wrong answers. I mean. Yeah, just sheet music, right? Um, that's right. We will never be 100% accessible. There are always going to be specific issues with individuals that while we have followed standard and we've made the environment to the point of an automatic door, we still might not completely get there. There are those times or you might need an accommodation. So, again, accessibility, and this is the definition for accessibility that has been provided to us by Tennessee Higher Education Commission, and specifically, they didn't reinvent this, they actually took it from the significant guidance from the federal government. The federal government said, look, this is what we're letting you know to do in your definitions in dealing with persons with disabilities and how to meet your obligations. This is what you want to define accessible as. Accessible means that individuals with disabilities are able to independently acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services within the same time frame as individuals without disabilities with substantially equivalent ease of use. Do you think we're there right now? No. Do you think we'll be there in five years? Eh, some of the stuff, yeah, and others, no. It's going to take time. So this, number one, that's why we're doing a sample audit of 30 courses, just to get an idea where the entire system is in their materials so we can begin planning and each institution can begin moving forward and how we're going to finally meet this definition. And there will be some situations. The reason why there's a substantially equivalent ease of use clause is because there are times where it is not technically feasible to provide that definition unless you have a substantially equivalent alternative available. Does that make sense? Okay. So, think about this. Accessibility and the way we're looking at it is actually usable by whom? Everybody. Everybody right? So, everybody say it with me. Accessibility is for everybody okay that is uber important and I'm gonna use that trite phrase but I like it um, the point being is if we all can wrap our head around that component then we'll better understand how it applies to accommodation so in a distance learning compliant uh, component content is usable without additional modifications in other words we've already designed our materials our content we've already gotten those those tools that are accessible so a person can come, use the same material, do the same thing at the same time, and independently do it. That's, that's that process. Even in the classroom, that means the same thing. Appropriate functionality is already designed. So this is a, a front-end process. We work to make sure that they can go through that automatic door without even thinking about what ability they have. Then, what's the difference? Here it is. What is an accommodation? Well, let's talk about the definition of accommodation here. Accommodations are reasonable, and I'm going to use the 504 language because I like it better than the ADA language. I think it's more specific, although some people don't like to hear academic adjustments. Um, accommodations are reasonable academic adjustments or auxiliary aids that provide equal access to programs and services on an individual basis. So accessibility is for who? Accommodations are for the individual. Are you seeing the difference? We want to think about how we handle our materials and our decisions of what materials we choose and all those pieces here as a separate process because it is not accessible, I mean, excuse me, it is not an accommodation. What has been happening is our institutions across the nation have been dealing with accessible points, access points, as accommodations, as ad hoc issues, as, well, I'm going to provide an accommodation to this inaccessible instance of this material, when in reality, what we should have been doing is providing accessibility.
And that's why there's been so much significant guidance to help us understand that accessibility is usable by everybody independently at the same time, where accommodation is something entirely different. Now, can you think of what an accommodation would be? Has anybody dealt with accommodations in here? Okay, so not an accessibility or what has traditionally been a workaround for an inaccessible component. Can you think of an accommodation that would be for an individual? Interpreter. Yes, Interpreter. That's, that's a good example. Yes, distraction-free room. Does that have anything to do with accessibility and the material accessibility? And uh, No. In fact, again, we might not be 100% accessible because we have followed our standards to do everything we could to make our material accessible and our environment accessible and the software or whatever we might be using. But that student specifically needs extra time on tests. That's the accommodation that sits on top of that accessible environment. So you have an accessible environment, you've already done what you needed to do, but still a student needs an accommodation for an accommodation's sake because it is an individual situation, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so extra time on testing, for instance, is another good example. So what is the difference? Accessibility is achieved through the use of identified standards and those standards are WCAG 2.0 A and AA, EPUB 3, accessibility, to design environments to be used by everybody, including persons with disabilities. So we follow the standards, make sure the materials are accessible, go through that process, make sure we're going through the process of our decision making, to pull those pieces together so we have that automatic door moment or as close as we can get to it. So accessibility for everybody, because everybody can benefit from it. Accommodations, on the other hand, are requested by a person with a disability and determined to be reasonable on an individual basis by an appointed representative. Often, it is your disability services office, or if it's an employee, it might be HR. I don't know how you guys handle it here. Um, and again, accommodations may be needed beyond an accessible environment for equal access. So we have the environment accessible, but we need extra time on tests, right? I'm giving a test in the classroom, but I have a particular student that needs to be able to get access to that text, and it just so happens that they can't get access to print, so we provide them then the accessible Word document that you created the test in. And then they can use their assistive technology to be able to get access to it. Right. So, you've done your design, and then you have the individual. So accommodations for whom? Yes. Accessibilities for who? If you walk out of here today remembering that, that's going to be such a benefit to understand where you need to make that dividing line because accommodations are not accessibility. Accommodations are accommodations. Entirely different pieces. Now, in that process, that means that when we're thinking about accessibility, as the, excuse me, president of the University of Washington was saying, is it really is for accessibility up to all of us. Literally, all of us. Doesn't matter who you are. All of us have to work together to finally get here over time. Right now, we're dealing with academic affairs. Next year, we're going to be focusing on the other side of the house, as well as the libraries. So all these pieces and all of us moving together to understand how to design accessibly will make all the difference in the world in that portion of the process. Are all of us dealing with accommodations? No. You have a department for that. You have a specific individual or group of individuals that deal with the accommodation process. So now that we know that accessibility is for everybody and accommodations are for the individual, let me give you a scenario. As instructors, I decided, and this is an on-ground class, but I like to get my assignments turned in and I also provide materials back in the D2L experience. Um, 
I'm requiring assignments to be uploaded, then I'm giving those assignments back to the students through D2L with an audio file that I am discussing my markings on their assignments, along with, of course, they can see the assignment itself. Now, traditionally, if you have, for an accessibility component, if you have audio, then the accessible component to that audio, usable by everybody, would be a transcript. Now, we're talking about a classroom instance. The instructor's asking all 52 individuals to provide their homework. They go ahead and bring it up in Dropbox. He provides it back in D2L along with an audio file. Does that audio file need to be transcribed? Okay, only to the individual. And anyone else? Good to anybody who's hearing impaired. Okay. So, how are we analyzing this, this point? How are we using this point? Is this an individual interaction between the instructor and the student? Yes. So that means the instructor doesn't have to provide 52 transcripts. No. And in fact, doesn't have to provide any transcripts at all unless there is an accommodation in place. Do you understand why? Accessibility is for whom? Everybody. Right? Is this for everybody? No. That's why I use the scenarios to help you analyze that process and understand the difference between accessibility and individual accommodation. Huge difference. Now, if that instructor decides to take one of the student's examples and provide that example along with the audio file to the entire class, then what needs to happen? Transcript. Right. And because it's going to everybody. See the difference? Any questions on that scenario? I want to make sure we're real clear on that. Now, I did have a librarian ask me, well, does that mean that I could design every experience to be an inter individual interaction? I go, well, good luck with that. It would be far easier for you to design everything for everybody than try to manage an individual interaction with everyone. That's not going to happen. Or it might happen, but boy, you're just going to be so busy, I don't know how you're going to handle it. So the bottom line is this. In this situation, it's an individual action similar to like if you're at meeting in office hours. And if you require an accommodation, that's different. That's an accommodating point. That's not an access point. But once that file and that material goes over to everybody in the classroom, then yes, everybody will benefit from it being made usable by everybody by having that transcript available. Does that make sense? Okay. I want to make sure you're clear on that because accessibility is for everybody and accommodation is for the individual. And that's a good example of being able how to apply that. Any questions before I go any further? No? Awesome.